So with that, we are ready for our next talk. And that is us going a deeper into how the Lens Protocol is set up uh, so you can actually learn about the internals of what you can actually do from a graph standpoint. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome David and Josh to go into all those details. Josh, uh, uh, David, appreciate this. And uh, I'll, I'll let you uh, get started. Awesome, thank you. Thank you so much. Let me get our little presentation up here. Uh, GM everyone, my name is David. Uh, I'm the product manager for social over at Ave Companies, uh, and that includes a lens. Uh, and I'm super fortunate to be joined today uh, by Josh, uh, Josh Stevens. He is one of our amazing leading back, lead backend devs uh, who helped create the Lens API, which we're gonna get into uh, later today. And we just wanna give a quick overview of the Lens protocol, uh, you know, why we built it, what you can do with it, uh, what are some awesome things you can hack on it, try to give out some ideas, some alpha, uh, as well as what the Lens API is, why we built it, and, and, and what are some of the things you guys can build with it. Um, so without ado, let's kind of jump into a quick overview of Lens Protocol. So, you know, why did we go out and, and, and build Lens? Well, Web2 social media is, is broken. Um, networks, they sell your data. Um, I think this was mentioned a lot in the last session, but you're paying with your personal information uh, to get distribution. There's no such thing as privacy. The reason you're not paying for Facebook, you're not paying for Twitter, is they're taking their, your data, they're turning around and selling ads. Um, and, and additionally, your data is not portable. As a creator, as a user, I, I am bound to the network I'm working with. Um, if all of a sudden Facebook or YouTube decides to turn me off for any reason, I've lost my audience, I've lost my content, I've lost my connection to my fans, and, and, and that can spell the end of a career. Um, in addition, I have no ability to go between uh, any two services. Um, it, it, it turns this, uh, you know, this this social graph into a moat, uh, whether or not the app is better. Uh, if I'm a startup and I've created this really great new user experience, these new fair algorithms, or, or something that people like, uh, I, I have to bootstart this, you know, jumpstart this graph, uh, and I'm at a huge disadvantage, even though I have an objectively better product. And, and lastly, user data centralized. Right, we, we, we've all seen what happens when, when large databases exist, they become targets for hackers, uh, act, bad actors, things can get hacked, data gets leaked, never a good situation. Uh, the last thing we need is, is, is more scams uh, and, and more hacks. And so the, the goal with Lens is to use Web3 tools uh, to bring power back to the users, back to the creators, uh, and, and really change the game theory of Web2 of web social. It's currently zero sum. Uh, you know, Facebook only makes money off of data in their system, as does Twitter, uh, as does TikTok, and, and they're all incentivized to really lock you into those ecosystems, build in positive feedback loops. Uh, using Web3, we can turn on its head, and, and we're going to do that um, with Lens Protocol. Um, we are going to allow developers to build apps and tools on a singular, composable, and decentralized social graph. So, so, so what does that mean? It means that we are going to have all of the data built using NFT technology owned by users um, on, on, a, on a permissionless blockchain. Um, you know, we are, we are currently building on Polygon. Our test nets are on the Mumbai test net. We're getting ready to go to mainnet soon. Um, and it allows app developers to focus on the user experience on a UI, a UX and content moderation um, rather than user acquisition. And for creators and users, you own your links to your audience, you own your content, and you own your monetization. Um, and if you don't like a certain platform and you want to go elsewhere, it's as easy as clicking currently today, Connect Wallet. Um, I agree with what Balaji said in the last session of hopefully we get better terminology. So with that, let's let's dive into a little bit of, of how Lens works under the hood. What is the actual kind of infrastructure that, that we're building? Um, the first kind of key primitive is, is the profile, the profile NFT. Um, if you've ever worked with unstoppable domains or ENS, very, very similar. We have this, this NFT that represents your profile. It's got your handle. For example, I could be at David, Josh would be at Josh. Uh, it lives in my wallet. I can have multiple in the same way that when I'm on Twitter, I have at David E. Silverman, my nice fancy professional account, and, and a couple of anons where I like to you know, post, post things that I want to keep personal. Um, it's minted upon creation. Um, I can have other metadata on there, maybe a bio. Um, but I also have this special array uh, that I can fill with publications. Um, this is where I kind of post my content to. And, and we'll come back to exactly what publications are, are in a minute. 
Um, in addition, it has another field called follow module. Uh, and we're gonna come to that uh, a bit later as well. The next thing we have is, is following. Um, we represent follow with a, a follow NFT. Um, if, if my wallet, davidev.eth wants to follow at Josh, uh, I, I, will, I will execute that transaction using Lens uh, and I will receive a at Josh follow NFT. It'll say that I follow at Josh. Um, it will have an, an, a token ID based on the order I followed. So I'm his fifth follower. Um, and it will also have a reference to his latest publication, which is really interesting because it means when I go to try to render this follow NFT in, in any wallet, whether that be you know, Rainbow or, or even a smart contract wallet like Gnosis Safe, or, or I go to OpenSea or Zapper, um, it's going to resolve to whatever his last publication was, which means every single wallet uh, has now become a, uh, a distribution mechanism uh, for, for, my, for, my, uh, for me as a creator, a content creator. In addition, these follow NFTs have built-in governance. And so every creator has a built-in social token just without the ERC-20. Um, let's say Josh uh, tweets out a bunch of really great developer alpha. Uh, he, he, you know, he, he publishes out a lot of great stuff on Solidity. He can pull his audience, you know, should he be, should he be doing on Snapshot? You can say, I want my first 500 followers, you know, have them tell me uh, if I want to do uh, some more stuff on, on maybe Aave V3 or if I want should be diving into Alchemix V2. And his let his audience kind of decide what he wants to build. We then kind of get into what a publication is. So a publication uh, is just really kind of a, a, a bunch of metadata that says where to find content and, and some things about that content. Um, Lens takes is completely agnostic as to where the actual data itself is stored. You could reference a place on chain. You could also reference IPFS, AR Weave, uh, Ceramic. You could even reference Old Web 2, uh, a URL or, or an S3 bucket. Um, and that just tells you where to get the content. And in the metadata, you can fill out anything as you normally would. You can even say what application it's posted with. Um, you can also add this thing uh, called a collect module, which will produce a collect NFT. Um, this allows any publication to be turned into its own standalone NFT, um, where the creator kind of defines the, the minting logic. Um, let's say I post this really great image uh, of a recent trip to London. Um, my, I can set monetization. I want to allow you know, anyone to be able to collect this, that's our term for mint, for one ETH. Um, and when they go through and pay me the one ETH, all of a sudden they have an, a collect NFT in their wallet uh, exactly mirrored from the original publication. I can even include additional logic uh, for mirrors. Mirrors is how somebody retweets. Uh, so if somebody wants to share my content, let's say I post that really great image uh, uh, of my trip from London and Josh decides to mirror that on his own feed and somebody collects it from seeing Josh's feed, I can actually specify a, a certain amount of that uh, mint fee to go to Josh's wallet. And so we can actually even incentivize curation entirely on chain. Um, publications come in, in three types, regular posts, which is uh, the plain use case. I've posted an image or I've posted a piece of text or I've posted a video using live peer. Um, it also has this concept of comment, which is um, a reference to another, another publication as well as some additional content. So I can comment on someone else's uh, image with uh, with my own with an, with my own image. Maybe it's a meme with my own text. This is a great image, or, or again, any other arbitrary content. And the last type of publication is a mirror, just a simple reference. Uh, that's the same thing as a, a retweet or a share. We're talking in current Web two uh, formulation. Now, as a as a Web three developer, how can I kind of build in interesting uh, extensions to Lens? Well, Lens kind of has these things called modules, and they allow you to build arbitrary logic onto, uh, onto Lens protocol. And they, they come in three places, and they, they are really powerful. The first one is the follow module, and this is set on a, on a per profile basis. The follow module, it runs, it's arbitrary logic that will run, uh, and it has to resolve to a Boolean yes or no to let you know whether or not a follow NFT is minted. So when my wallet, davidev.eth, tries to follow at Josh, his follow module will run and using some series of conditions will decide whether or not me, David E. V. ETH, the wallet is allowed to follow him. And, and we can do really powerful things with that, right? I, I can say that only people who hold certain NFTs are allowed to follow me. Maybe I wanna restrict it to certain NFTs on Polygon, or I could even use a chain link Oracle to say, you have to hold an AVAX warrior on AVAX or a board ape or a punk on mainnet in order to follow me. Um, I, I can make it payment. You have to pay me five ETH to follow me. Uh, I could make it 
you have to have some co-op or been at these different events. You can make it as complex as you would like. Uh, any of these, so long as it kind of just comes back to a, a zero or one value. Additionally, you can have that follow NFT go to a, a smart contract. You could use that to, you know, build out subscriptions. If you don't top up this contract every now and then, uh, you know, one with five Matic every month, um, I'm going to pull away your follow relationship. And now we've built kind of subscriptions. The next one is a reference module. And this is run before uh, somebody tries to comment or mirror my piece of content. So I, I post an image, let's say, uh, via my at David profile. If uh, at Josh wants to try to comment or mirror, uh, the reference module will run on a per publication basis and decide whether or not, remember a Boolean answer at the end, whether or not Josh is allowed to reference either comment or mirror. And again, I, I can do simple token gating. Uh, only people with 32 FWB are allowed to reply to my content. Uh, only people who have uh, certain NFTs are allowed to reply to my content. And I, I can combine this with other higher level integrations. A, a really interesting use case would be, what if I wanted to build a completely private social network uh, on top of Lens? Well, I could have the actual content in a publication be stored in Ceramic, encrypted using Lit Protocol, another sponsor in this hackathon. And I could have the, the access control uh, B, you need to have at least 32 ETH in your wallet to get the decryption in order to see what the post is. And I can also have the comment, collect, uh, and, and mirror functions all require that I have 32 FWB in my wallet at a given time. And then the only people who are allowed to engage with my content, view, you know, sorry, read and write, need to be in my community. And so that's, that's reference. And the last area is collect. I think collect is really the most powerful. And that is logic that is run to decide whether or not this kind of collect NFT, uh, this NFT that references this original publication uh, is minted. So the example is I, I post an image and I can say, you know, for one ETH, this gets minted out into an NFT that you can control. I can set a cap, hey, here's, you only can do this five times. Uh, you can do this five times with incrementing. Uh, so the first one is one ETH, the next one is 1.1 ETH. We can also do really complex logic and community has really jumped at this. We, we have a, the community wrote one that does DeFi aware NFTs. So I will sell my NFT for five Matic, but before the transaction completes, it takes the Matic, deposits it into Aave and sends the A tokens uh, to the creator. So now creators have kind of, you know, self-driving NFTs. Um, we have another one, the, the great folks over at, um, at Klima came and built in the refi collect module. Um, which you could even extend the logic further and say, hey, take some of the, you know, look at how much gas this transaction used, convert that to carbon offsets, take some of the incoming, um, the incoming funds, convert it using Toucan to base carbon, base carbon token, retire it on chain. And now my entire transaction is carbon neutral. So that's some of the stuff you can do with collect and different ways for people to build on top of lens. And what our goal with Lens is to really foster a broad, diverse, and evolving social ecosystem. Fully composable and transferable on-chain social graph. You can go from one application to another. You can bring all of your followers, you can bring all of your content, you can bring all of your NFT and it's, NFTs and it's composable to any other application, whether it be NFT minters, whether it's DeFi or other blockchain applications that are yet to come can build on top of these existing tools that we're building. Follower NFTs allow for social DAOs and new types of social tokens. Governance mechanisms, including snapshot, delegation, and compatibility with Aave governance, as well as Governor Bravo are fully built in. And lastly, the real key thing is modularity. We allow developers to focus on the experience and the front end and leave the network effects to the protocol. You don't need to create a bootstrapping plan. You know, As users start using any application built with Lens, your application has access to all of those users as well. We, we call the protocol Lens as the Lens plant you know, enriches the soil around it and allows other plants to grow around it. And that's kind of our view from the ecosystem, changing from a zero sum game that we currently see in web two to a collaborative sum game in web three. Now, in addition to just the web three, um, you know, the web three hooks that we have with modules, Josh is gonna to talk to you about the Lens API, which is something that we have built at Aave to allow solidity three, solidity free web three social development. Josh. Cheers, David. Um, bear with me, I have got COVID, but I should be okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, we have 
um, built a API for all of this. So if you're building a social media site, uh, the key things that are super important is you know speed. Um, you know if you're on Twitter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, if you lose that speed, it becomes unfun. Uh, scalability um, and traceability. All these things are super important to be able to get to. Um, now we were building an API anyway for our own internal needs, but we thought, why not share that with you guys? So the API is, it abstracts all the complex things about the, 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 the protocol away. So as David's been talking about how many amazing features there is, um, like modules, different kind of modules that take in different input parameters, all these kind of things. Um, the API abstracts that away to a simple enum uh, with you know, standard stuff to pass in. If you want to enable a reference module uh, that only your followers can uh, comment, it's a Boolean and it will construct the data for you, the sign type data, and then you just send it on the client. So uh, it's more of more of a helper tool uh, and a traceability tool. Um, and we think it's super important that, you know, if we're going to build the next social platform that we have tools so Web2 developers can just focus on building a, say, board Ape community or, um, you know, anything like that without having to understand the protocol completely because it is you know quite overwhelming with how many features there is um so that's the idea do you want to hit the next slide david um so build front ends fast with the lens api so you don't have to worry about indexing or querying the data or reorgs or speed or fetching the data everything is done for you um and everything's done super quick so we have an indexer watching all the data we index that data so we can grab it quick. Um, and when you get a publication back, all that data is extracted for you. If someone said, hello world, that data would say content, hello world, it would extract the um, module for you saying, you know, they have a fee to collect this, which is 0.01 ETH. Um, one ETH. Uh, and then you have a simple way to be able to construct that and redeem it with another function called collect. Uh, so all these things allow you to, um, you know, really just focus on what you guys need to build and want to build. Um, you don't have to deal with any real data. So we have crons watching the data, making sure that the hash still exists and then removing them, them away um, from the uh, queries if they, if they don't exist anymore. Uh, we have full caching layer on there to allow this to be super quick. Uh, you know, the, the, the queries are really, really fast to kind of grab everything that you want. Um, you know, some of this data to grab is super complex, like, you know, a publication can include, you know, how many times it's been mirrored, how many times it's been collected, how many comments it's got. Uh, a publication is an unlimited pointer. So what I mean by that is you can have a post and a comment and it can go unlimited depth and it can keep pointing and pointing and pointing. So um, being able to scale that, uh, like how Facebook and Twitter do really quickly to have that user experience is super important. Um, you don't have to worry about pre-filling the contract data or validating it. And what I mean by that is we have these with sig methods that uh, you know you just pass, you want to collect a publication and all you literally do is pass the publication ID. It will construct you all the type data for you. It will A, validate that you conform to all the modules as well. So say you have to follow to collect this publication. It will validate that for you and throw a web two error saying, hey, you don't follow this person so you can't collect. Uh, it does that for everything for, uh, you know, if you don't have enough balance, if you don't, if you haven't approved an, um, enough for the token, uh, all these things allow a much better development experience where straight away, you know, oh, that's gone wrong with the protocol or what, you know, and this person doesn't have enough balance, et cetera, et cetera. As I said before, it's a web two style interface. So if you go to the Twitter API, it's super easy to just go and get all the followers or, you know, following, yes, it's heavily rate limited, um, but we took inspiration from the kind of, you know, the web two interfaces and just as easy it is to get the followers that um, are on Twitter. It's just as easy to get the followers that are on Lens. Uh, it's just as easy to grab all the publications. It's just as easy to get everything a, a user has collected. Um, and all these things is super important for growth for the Lens protocol. Um, and I think what, one of the biggest things is there's not a huge learning curve. You know, the whole API is built using GraphQL. Uh, you know, it's super easy to fetch what you need when you need it. Um, and you can just focus on the stuff that you want to build. So all the documentation is, is there for you to use. Uh, and yeah, we're super excited for you guys to use it and give us some feedback about how it helped you or how we could improve it. Uh, yeah, it's uh, super cool.
Awesome. Thanks, Josh. A few other things I want to point out about the API that I think are going to be kind of key and, and also point a bit about the strategy we're doing with Lens. You know, the first thing is we want to give Web3 developers really awesome new powerful tools to build with. Um, some of the ones we're super excited about are these DeFiware NFTs with collects or really trying to see what people can do with follow NFTs and this concept of social DAOs. Um, on the Web2 side, right, we want to make things easy and approachable for brand new developers, right? Not every single person wants to be an expert in Solidity or should be an expert in Solidity. The reason Web3 Social is going to win out is because we're approachable for everyone. And that was really the goal with the Lens API. We also want to make sure that every single application built on, Lens a on the Lens API is going to get a top-notch set of features. So they're beyond just access to the full social graph, there are built-in queries for, for search, for timeline, for explore, common pages you may want to put in a social graph. And in addition, you know, we have it, we have a data science team, the same kind of app, you know, we've we've kind of said that Ave is working on its own front end. The same algorithms that'll be powering that are going to be ported through the API. So as 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 those algorithms kind of get built out and improved, your application will gain from that as well. We think that's kind of a, a big thing we want to help out. Not everyone's a data science expert. You know, you can kind of pump in from an existing awesome data science team. And the last thing is really making easy to use tools so people can focus on novel and unique um, experiences. We want to abstract away the blockchain for developers who may not be familiar with it. And that's really the design goal of, of, of the Lens API. Can I just add one more thing, just to put it into perspective of how much easier that it makes for you. Um, to unfollow someone, uh, actually to do that, you have to burn the follower NFT of that profile. Now that profile itself, every profile has their own follower contract address, right? And you could have minted three or four different tokens in there. And on chain, there's no way to go, hey, how many tokens do I own of this without looking at the instant indexer? But with the API, you literally just go, I want to unfollow this profile. It will construct all the data for you. It will do all that, all the joins that needs to happen. And all you do is sign and send that transaction. And then you've unfollowed that person. Um, that's just one of many examples where uh, it really helps um, the development of anything that you do on this protocol. And definitely a big thing I also want to I want to shout out is you know we we have our bounty tracks. I think I think you know we teased this at, at the start of this session. We're really looking for people to build front ends on top of it. I know there was a uh, some some people talking in the chat like, is there a reference UI? Well, we hope that people build a reference UI. There's been a couple of great tools uh, in the Lens community that's been built so far. Uh, inside of, uh, if you go to the Lens Discord, um, I think there was a there was a, a simple explorer, a profile creator, and a way to build statuses, and that was running on our on our test net. Um, for anyone building, please make sure you use the new test net. Um, we're looking for protocol people who are going to build some really novel, interesting collect modules, reference modules, and uh, follow modules. I think there was a, a a brainstorm session we were doing in the uh, in the voice chat of Discord, and somebody was talking about it. They they were thinking you could do you know, on-chain private DMs with read receipts using custom collect modules, uh, lit protocol and ceramic. Um, not saying that hits a couple different sponsors for the hackathon and partners, maybe it's a cool thing to build. Um, there's tons of really awesome things to, that, 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 that can be built here. And on the tooling side, we wanna make it so that this is still a friendly place for developers. Um, you know, building explorers, building vampire attacks to help the entire network gain from stealing users from Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, uh, TikTok. I'm probably going to get in trouble with legal for saying all these names, but I'm I'm, I'm calling out targets. We want we want we want these. Uh, you know, we want people. We want everyone to kind of gain from Web3 social. Um, show that there's more use cases for blockchain than just speculative tokens. And then lastly, you know, Stani said earlier in the last session, you're never building by yourself, but you're always part of an ecosystem. And we've learned this really, really early on with Lens. The community has jumped through our bounty program and built more modules than, than we even built as the original Genesis team and has given so much feedback. We had to redeploy a brand new test net just for this hackathon um, to make sure that people were using the most up-to-date feature set. Um, and so we really encourage, as you guys are building, please provide feedback. What else do you want to see in the contracts? What else should we be putting in to all of these different, uh, to all of these different uh, primitives? Or you can write updates to the primitives yourself. You know. Um, come help build this next generation social graph. And same for the API. What else do you want to see in this API? How can we make your lives easier as developers? How can we make this community grow? How can we do it all together? How can we really help this ecosystem? So, you know, we, we are, we are going to be around uh, all week in the ETH Global. 
uh, Discord. We're going to be in the Lens Discord. We're going to be on Twitter. Um, so really, really definitely want to want to hear from you on what we can do best. Um, so that's a, you know, that's, that's lens at a very high level. Um, as always, you can reach out to anyone on the team for questions, feedback and comments. And, and we look forward to seeing what, what everyone here builds. And, and we hope you guys have a great hackathon. Thanks guys. Um, Kartik, sending it back over to you. Hey, we're back. Kartik broke away from the, uh, had a little technical issue there. So we're going to go to a quick break. Thank you guys. That was awesome. Much appreciated. And um, everybody, we can uh, hold for just a couple minutes till our next talk comes. Thanks, everyone. All right. Um, sorry about that. I just uh, I had some technical difficulties on on my end. Everybody, um, I think we are a little bit ahead of uh, kind of. Uh, <coughs> apologies. We're a little bit ahead of schedule here. So uh, what we'll do is kind of take a quick break. I know a lot of you've been kind of watching this for a good uh, uh, two hours already with the logistics and the last panel and the discussion. So uh, while we wait for the next uh, set of speakers to kind of join in and get ready for our next uh, talk, um, we will take a quick uh, five minute break and uh, and then come back. So uh, we'll just kind of put on timer. In the meantime, enjoy some lo-fi beats and uh, we'll see you all very shortly.
All right. Welcome, everybody. Hope you had a good, uh, quick uh, five minute break. And with that, we are ready for our next talk. So next talk, we're going to talk about what does it mean to kind of get more creative on building on top of Lens. And for this panel, we actually have three uh, amazing people. So we have Rich, Ramon, and Simon uh, from We3, and they're going to be talking about all the things that you can do and how you can extend uh, your creativity with, with Lens. So without further ado, let's welcome all of them here on stage and I'll ask them to turn their videos on and uh, I'll let you all get started. Hey everyone, uh, nice to meet you. Um, I think we, should we just get started, Kardik? Absolutely, yes. Also, uh, you should uh, flip the video on so uh, the live stream can see you as well. Uh, one second, just going to the start of our slides. Okay. Um, Give me one second. Uh, can you see at least my slides for now? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Cool. Um, shit. So, okay. Uh, Rich, Simon, are you guys ready to? So I can kick it up. Absolutely. Go for it. Good. Okay. Cool. So uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for being, pro this is talk number three, four. Uh, so still staying with us and excited to have uh, quite a few folks here to kind of like listening to what we have uh, uh, brought to you today. Um, today, it's a lot about kind of like, what can you do with Lens and what, like how to think differently about what products or innovation you can build on top of it. And, uh, Kind of like what where where this could lead. So I, I think we already heard a lot from Stani and uh, Josh and David of like what Lens is. So I shortly just kind of like want to introduce us in the call and maybe uh, Rich and Simon. Once you talk, you maybe can just introduce yourself very shortly, who you are and kind of like what you do. But uh, I'm Ramon. I'm part of We Free. We Free is a web free design collective so we're a bunch of designers who realized that web free is growing exponentially and it's one of the most interesting area for design to come in because it's early because we don't really know yet how to use it best because it's still hard to use and so we came together and we realized there's a lot of space for making the space more accessible more inclusive uh, opening it up for the next generation of users and uh, we prefer, primarily do this through helping through product and uh, brand strategy, product design and brand strategy, and really help kind of like building narratives from like early ideas to actually bring it to uh, the market. Uh, maybe a little bit of how we got involved in Lens, just to kind of like as a little bit of disclosure, we have been working with them since quite a while in the background to really shape the brand and the the, the brand itself of Lens, but also kind of like help expand what Lens could mean for the ecosystem. I think Stani was saying is like, it's really about building an ecosystem. And so what we have been tasked to help out in the last few weeks is really kind of like pushing the edges of like what Lens could do in several places and really help to kind of like shape that. So with that, I would love to shortly talk about why uh, we or we believe or I believe uh, social graphs matter or what social graphs are. Um, being a designer in that space, I, I think it took me quite a while to understand what the hell is a social graph? Why does it matter? And uh, I, I or we use the metaphor of kind of like, it's a little bit an iceberg. So like we know social media, we know news feeds, we know friends lists, we know that it matters to have friends online or being able to connect to them and like write with them through messengers. But it's really kind of like just the top of the iceberg that we really see here. And there's like, there's so much data and connections and content or connections that below the surface that are part of the social graph that are not really accessible for us, but they're also kind of like the bread and butter of like the traditional web two platforms like Facebook, Twitter and all of that. So I kind of like think for, mo for most people that come into this space talking about the social graph, it's really just kind of like the top of the iceberg, but like what is really exciting is like what lies below that. And 
what we mean with that is like that basically everything has a social graph, right? When we started to explore Lens, it was a lot about like, is this social media? Is this a new news site? Is this a feed? Is this a friends list? Is, like, what is it really? And the reality today is that basically everything that Web2 touches and potentially Web3 will touch too, has a social graph, has a social component where we connect with each other, being it from sending and transacting from one wallet to one wallet, kind of like uh, following someone's on-chain activity to kind of like the more traditional Web2 applications like Twitter or all of that. So when thinking about where Lens is going, I think one thing, oh, wrong button, is this is bigger than decentralized Twitter. I feel like when we start to ideate in this space, we often end up with decentralized Twitter, uh, a new news site. It's like the, the go-to things. And we really wanted with this kind of like exploration and what we're gonna show you today to kind of a push what, what an open graph can enable for an ecosystem itself. What do we, what do we mean with this is that a social graph touches obviously social media and news feeds, right? It it's about how the a news feed is curated, what we're seeing there. But like when we start to zoom out there, it's as much about music, movies, and entertainment, right? We share playlists, we get recommendations, we play together, we watch things, uh, let's play video on Twitch together. So it's kind of like all of those has a huge social component, how we kind of like connect with each other and do things together. And like that can be even broader in the sense of like uh, in, in the realm of like uh, matchmaking. So like it's it can lean from car, uh, uh, creators matching to create something together on TikTok through a duet to kind of like actual matchmaking through dating to finding collaborators in a DAO. So like a lot of those are built on social connections and and doing that. So it's like Web3 is already inherently social and we need to get to the next step there. And that can, and I think like when we think about where a social graph can be helpful, it's as much about social media, the metaverse, governance, shopping, working, gaming. It really can encompass all of this, which makes it sometimes really hard to start, but also kind of like shows hopefully how broad, broadly applicable, like a protocol like Lens could be. So with that, we wanted to kind of like highlight what are some core challenges that we think uh, we can address through new new experiences and new product design. And one thing is there's a huge chance to kind of like give more power or control uh, to users. So we surrender, like with Web2, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, you name it, TikTok, we surrendered a lot of power and control for convenience, right? We give away control over, over our data with sign in with Google and now we have wallets. So like we're really kind of like in a state of empowering the user again, but like this empowering is also kind of like frightening, but like it's actually really kind of like a new paradigm shift for social media that you're in control of your social graph, of your connections and that you can shape it and control it. And that's quite a no novelty. So like the question for us really should be, so how might we balance the control and the power that we gain with kind of like also ease of use through better UX and UI design here so that we still get some of that convenience back. Number two that we think is super valuable here is like around uh, insights. And the, the reality is we have a information asymmetry in the current uh, social graph world, right? Uh, platforms like Spotify, like Google, like all of that, they have a ton of data on us and we might potentially even have access to that, but it's really hard for us to understand and acting on that. Like, so platforms often more know about ourselves than we do. And I think with opening up the social graph now of that, again, this power of insight, this reflection and understanding can shift back to us. So kind of like, how can we use web free on-chain uh, activity, this general more transparency in this space to, to give not just not just to create more trust, but like also more insights about ourselves. So what if if those open graphs that we talk about kind of like really allow us to understand and reflect about ourselves, our communities in new ways. Next, I think it's important to kind of like acknowledge that Lens is a protocol, not a platform. And um, I, I 
still uh, stole this one from one of my favorite paper called like uh, platforms uh, protocols on a platform but i think that this kind of like idea of like portability that you're able to choose how you experience content or being in control of that or moving moving your friends list or your friends list is moving with you and doesn't have to be established again it's quite a big change in like how we understand like uh open graphs itself so uh, this idea of portability is not novel for us i feel in web3 where we have wormholes where we have uh, talk about cross chain and like we're trying to figure that out but like the, this idea of like that social media is not a unique universe a world garden but it's more like the marvel cinematic multiverse where things can coexist and connect with each other i feel is quite a novelty and like so thinking about this what we're going to talk about is kind of like leaning into the last point is the more power we have the more we understand ourselves and the data that's established through those places and kind of like we create more portability that allows us to completely rethink what a front end could be like how we interact with it right it's like if you don't like how a, what data you get out of a front end or if that could be more like you you move on you build your own and like that that is a quite novel approach to kind of like go often also going a little bit more back how the internet was like a long time ago. So what this allows us to do, it's kind of like, it allows to kind of like lead with better design because there's more competition, hopefully more choice. And like also, oh, not everything has to be broad. You can also design uh, for, for niches itself. So with that, that's kind of like a little bit an intro how we got excited about working with Lens itself and like why social graphs matter. And I'm handing this over now to uh, Rich and Simon to kind of like dive a little bit into uh, some clusters of ideas that we had so far. Um, Rich, Simon, I'm going to mute myself, but please free to move on. Nice. Um, thanks, Ramon. Um, yeah, so we've got a few ideas that we've been uh, tinkering on. You know, obviously, it's such a such a big space, such a big area, so much opportunity of, of where to innovate. So, uh, where do we begin? Um, well, we've sketched out a few um, ideas that we'll share with you, uh, just to get the juices flowing. And you can consider these as kind of like interesting territories to explore. Um, some of them are really kind of like the natural breaking points of where Web to social media sort of breaks down, or where you might sort of find the cracks there. Um, and other areas are really where sort of Web3 enables us to create something net new. Um, so you'll hear us talk a lot about what ifs, we'll be sort of posing a few questions. Uh, really, really, these are just kind of prompts against which we think um, would be interesting to explore. So you know, let us know what you think, riff with us, ask questions, and uh, throw ideas down in the chat as well. So let's, uh, let's dive right in. Yeah, absolutely. You're going to hear a lot of what ifs from us uh, for the next little while. So. So settle in, uh, but we're kicking off with some ideas around uh, lens tooling, because uh, when we're we're building something new here, something from the ground up, which means that you know we get to start pretty fresh, and we get to set set up the tools and the systems that help make us make the most of that sort of like green pasture of new social. Um, the issue is right now, much of today's tooling for social is completely boxed off. It's like pretty hard or impossible to change or to interact with. So it's it's really exciting to start to think about breaking that and giving users the power of the tools that make the most of that new social. So we've been thinking a little bit about some tools that people can create to get the most of their lens social graph. And if you give it a little scroll, now we've got one here, um, all about verification. Because right now, verification is controlled by social media platforms and not really the communities that grow into them or grow to use them. And that can like stifle the innovation or it can lead to even verification being a centralized platform swim. Cough, cough, blue tick. Uh, so what if social media verification meant more than just being a real person? What if it instead sort of captured any kind of label that was meaningful to a community or to an individual or set of individuals? So like broadening this kind of uh, this idea of verification to an extensible system of tags that could be attached to, you know, users, to communities, even to posts would help us open up a rich new set of experiences. So again, some what ifs, like what if a distributed fact checking community could tag posts that is researched and evaluated as like trusted. Maybe what if a curated collection of articles uh, written by award winners could easily be created and automatically kept up to date? What if an idea could even be traced back to its roots um, of, and its tree of posts and replies? 
And lastly, what if a company's online profile could be tagged with this global carbon footprint? But speaking of influence and that sort of like sense of meaning to the community, how about kind of getting a sense of where you as an individual community stand in your graph? Yeah, so um, another thing we're sort of thinking about is really the, you know, what's the default visual expression or sort of the visual viewing paradigm of, of your social media experience. And you know, today, the typical, just to give it some context, so you can sort of understand you know, where the ideas are coming from, but you know, the typical viewing paradigm really centers around like an infinite feed of content um, that's designed by the businesses and the platforms really to drive as much engagement and uh, as much consumption as possible. And I don't know if you guys have seen the social uh, dilemma, but uh, the guy that in, you know, invented infinite scroll sort of often regrets kind of how that's led to a lot of mindless consumption. So, you know, things like your relationships and what you actually might learn about them um, seem to be things that are really like secondary features in, in today's social media experience. So uh, you don't really see those things that they're just, they're just lists of contacts in secondary features. Um, with something like the open social graph, though, I mean, I think what's interesting here is that because this is these experiences are being powered by that data, it's like this ever growing model that's capturing information about your relationships with people, you know, groups and communities and even businesses. Um, now that we would have ownership over that, what's also interesting is that we also have um, choice uh, or possibility about how uh, data is actually expressed or visualized. So, you know, the question that we're exploring here is, uh, you know, what other ways could you express or visualize your social graph? You know, what other new paradigms might we create to view your experience? And uh, in this little illustration we've got here, my digital roots, um, you know, we're imagining something more of an interactive graphical view. Uh, it's like a sketch, uh, but of what your relationships look like. And um, this is something that could emphasize relationships over content. So. You can imagine different filters and, and, and different toggles that you switch on and off to kind of, you know, explore your network. Um, but, you know, what else could it do? Perhaps it could actually help you see the degree of your influence or your reach um, or even your exposure to different types of people from different groups. <clears throat> Perhaps you could also even see like timelines of your relationships and how your connections have flourished or diminished over time. And you know, perhaps even understand more insightfully, like things like your frequency of contact or the dynamics of, or the interactions that, of your exchanges with others. So there's a lot of insight that can actually be drawn that we're not privy to at the moment in sort of web two social media. And these are things that could be interesting. And when you sort of frame it in the idea of like, you know, could you actually improve your relationships with people? It, it starts to become quite interesting. And then you think about um, what could this mean, not just to your, friendship circle, but when you start to consider teams or professional networks, like what happens then? Um, and uh, yeah, to sort of like close out this little sort of territory, like Rich will sort of uh, chime in now on um, what tools could be like to make the most of your experience with, with it. Yeah, you give us a scroll there, Ramon. Yeah, so right now, um, you know, we're all using the web. And we're all subject to these really opaque algorithms that are kind of ruling the current social media experience. You know, they're deciding what to show or even what vanishes into the ether and what doesn't get seen um, by users. And we've got very little sort of influence over what we actually see um, because those algos are trade secrets. You know, we're unable to show how the inputs and the interactions can influence the kind of contents that we might then consume. So what if we were able to have greater control over our feeds, over the way we can consume different media across platforms, set our own rules, even our own standards, our own algorithms by which to kind of sort, uh, filter and discover that content. Then the open graph uh, not only allows anyone to build their own front end experiences, but also perhaps the very engines themselves that define how content uh, breaks through to the surface. You can infuse a point of view over which uh, content should be prioritized and filtered based on different needs and different tastes um, at your own whim. So a few what ifs. What if uh, you could choose from multiple open sourced algorithms or lenses uh, by which you could view your lens feed? What if there are easy ways to manage permissions around what personal data a front end might use to personalize recommendations? Or what if those algorithms were like completely transparent and tunable to this point that you might even be able to jump in and sort of change a, 
change a lever to see what you what you're viewing. And then this is a fun one. What if you could even flick a switch and have a completely different content experience? Even like view the world through the eyes of your friends, celebrities, or like total wild cards from the other side of an echo chamber. But that's enough about those kind of foundations, that, that kind of tooling. What about what we should do specifically for creators? Yeah, so I mean, obviously this is, you know, when you think of Web3 and social media, it's very much synonymous with creators and the creator economy. And it just feels like there's so much potential to create new types of experiences for creators, but also for fans as well. And I think like we're interested in um, also how you can sort of foster connection from nuanced data around tastes and preferences. How can that inform and power new, new types of connection between creators, but also between um, creators and fans? Um, so if we scroll down a little bit, one of the things we're wondering about is uh, the idea of collaboration and, and how matchmaking could serve um, greater collaboration, how, how Lens sort of might facilitate that. And, and to give it some, some backstory, I mean, today, you know, creators around the world, you know, they collaborate with fellow artists and writers and musicians and brands um, to develop fresh content. And often it's about furthering reach and actually growing audiences as well as, you know, experimenting with different types of content. Um, and, you know, you tend to find that it creates new dialogue, can bring communities together and, and all that sort of good stuff. But I think what's sometimes challenging is, you know, how do you find and, and signal that you're sort of looking for this sort of collaboration, whether it's for like a project or for an art piece or for a DAO or for a brand, how do you find the people to work with? Um, so the question we're exploring here is, you know, how might we use our insights in the open graph um, to match creators together and catalyze new content and uh, creative collaborations? So how do we make that seamless, sort of more easy? And um, we're thinking about tools for things like audience insight and matchmaking. So in our little sketch here, you can imagine <clears throat> a creator is seeing different types of, of uh, potential matches or collaborators that are being served to them. And here we've got it kind of like a you know, sort of Tinder style where you're, where you're seeing different types of folks perhaps matched on certain criteria or content or preferences, or perhaps it's about, you know, like how you're signaling certain project ambitions. Um, and then next to that, like the idea of like this merged graph. So this is interesting when you have like a visual overlay, you know, what, what if you could have two creators that could easily and perhaps visually compare and contrast their audiences um, to see where they overlap in tastes and preferences, but also to sort of see the gaps and the differences where they sort of might grow. Um, so these are a few ideas just around uh, matchmaking uh, within the context of creators, but matchmaking of course is a theme that it's going to run through lots of different verticals as well. So, you know, what as you as you take this forward, you know, think about like what does this mean across different platforms, or even gaming, um, or finding collaborators and DAOs to start projects together, or even uh, dating. Um, but that's sort of a little bit about the creators. Now let's sort of think a little bit about uh, the fans as well. Yeah. What about flipping that about the sort of the fan experience? Because um, fan engagement is obviously huge for growth. Um, and access to, you know, maybe if you're a creator, access to the data about your followers, um, you know, or uh, uh, is pretty limited on today's platforms. It means that, you know, it could be pretty tricky to have sort of like valuable interactions or even, even any at all discussion to understand the sort of your fans and your followers. Oftentimes it's even like fragmented across different channels, across different apps. Uh, and it's really hard to have a sort of central discussion uh, to engage the sort of like feeling across the different channels. So we're thinking about how we, how might we provide creators with tools and resources, better understand their fans, even deepen their relationships, and really unlock the full value of their fan base. Um, and thinking that on the flip side as well, how can we also like bring it, open it up for fans to basically get closer to the creators uh, when you know as their time is valued as well and their their engagement is valued. So like lens could potentially enable creators to engage with their fans in any way they want and really get a 360 view of their fan base of their followers, maybe giving options to engage um, or to build connections that otherwise might not be possible. So I have some just ideas. What if creators could really get reports and breakdowns on who their fans are, who's consuming the most content, what they love, what they like, who they're from, get a sort of holistic view um, of everyone that's involved. And then 
maybe on a recognition point, like what if creators could even recognize individual fans with rewards, perks, personal experiences maybe, and gifts, perhaps even some direct contact as a way to sort of thank them for that support um, and show them that they're a valued fan. But then on to monetization over to you, Simon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, yeah, this one's really about monetization or commercializing content. And, um, uh, you know, this is something that I think bugs a lot of creators today. And it's very difficult to find a, a way to have a viable, sustainable living on, on web to sort of social media. Um, you know, there's, there's always a few issues at play. I mean, platforms take a large cut of any profits you make anyway. Um, but also creators aren't always just free to focus on their content because they have to worry about how do they beat the algorithm? You know, how do they climb higher in the rankings in order to kind of better mon uh, position themselves to, to monetize um, their content? And while also having to, you know, maintain towards community guidelines or guidelines and rules set by the platforms, which seem to be ever changing. So it's, it's a sort of frustrating loop that I think a lot of creators get stuck in. So really it sort of feels that um, it's a system in which there are limits to the freedom uh, of how you might sort of thrive both financially and, and creatively. So, you know, one question that we're thinking about for, for Lens and uh, what it could, could imply for creators is, is really like, what if you could relieve some of that pressure, you know? Um, and what if you could put more control and better tools back into the hands of creators um, in how they commercialize their content so they can both thrive financially and, and creatively. So, you know, um, obviously with NFTs and, and the sort of the boom there, like creating content on chain is gonna enable new forms of monetization, uh, different systems and, and also the way uh, that could be tuned and targeted towards different audiences. Um, also, it kind of lowers the barrier for new creators to enter the system. They don't have to fulfill, you know, minimum audience sizes and things like that to kind of actually participate and, and actually enjoy some revenue from their work. Um, so a couple of ideas here, like one of them is this idea of a, a dashboard, right? So monetization dashboard, you know, what if it was easy and simple for folks to um, automate or configure different options or systems by which to uh, monetize their content. So in the sketch, you can kind of see, you know, maybe it's an ad model, the, the traditional ad model, model that I switch on and a match made to brands. Uh, perhaps it's pay-per-view or sort of surge pricing or even subscription. And on the right, you know, perhaps I can just customize each post in different ways for, for different audiences. Maybe there's members I have or early bloomers or just like, what is it for everyone else? Um, but also, you know, beyond this too, you know, with content sort of minted, uh, sort of released on chain, I mean, um, we're also imagining tools that can track content across apps built on Lens so that creators can, you know, uh, monitor and track and receive income or royalties for or attributions for any content that's used by other creators on, on Lens apps. Um, and then the middle idea here is around membership. Right. So um, obviously we're seeing this in different forms on, on certain platforms like uh, Patreon, uh, et cetera. But, um, you know, what if creators could design their own membership programs and where they define the tiers of access and the different perks and rewards that uh, their different audiences might have? And um, also, can they even pull in their audiences or their top fans in, into their into their kind of orbit and actually help them grow and incentivize those fans and audiences in different ways with uh, financial rewards or tokens. So tons and tons of opportunities as it comes to uh, monetization. Um, and then now sort of back over to Rich for a little bit on uh, DAOs. Yeah, I hope everyone's clinging onto their seat in this avalanche of <laughs> ideas. <laughs> um, but we're getting there. But um, yeah, onto DAOs because DAOs and collectors they're like integral to the, the way of thinking, even the identity really of the sort of Web3 social world. But like oftentimes the tooling and front ends that we work with today, they're, they're you know, they're, they're uh, limited, uh, you know, for, for individual use um, or potentially even the ones are, are sort of, there's less of a social aspect to them. It's more about sort of the hard financials or the governance as, as we heard earlier. We've been thinking a little bit about how DAOs um, can have a sort of collective presence, giving them, you know, almost like a social soul of their own on the social graph. So you've given a little bit of a scroll there. 
There we go. Lovely. Uh, yeah. So, like social media today really is built for individuals um, and groups and companies like do have profiles. Um, the user experience is, you know, still orientated really around an individual person who controls the organization's account or perhaps, you know, maybe a, a team in bigger organizations and the like as well. And those platforms really are not set up at all for any sort of decentralized or ad hoc communities that may have, you know, a range of ways of organizing themselves. They might not fit into these sort of strict buckets. So like, what if there was uh, different voices in a community could come together under one profile, maybe one pop-up ad hoc profile without giving any one person complete control? And we kind of have this, you know, we have multi-sig crypto wallets where we can, you know, let a group of people follow, you know, a collective policy for transferring digital assets. So how about that for sort of a profile, if you like, for, for uh, managing, you know, a social presence of a collective? Yeah. What if a community could have a profile at a publication channel with a user uh, interface that really suits its governance style, its tools? Uh, maybe what if you could have pop-up sort of uh, communities around these things? What if there was like local fans of uh, Taqueria in Los Angeles were able to compete to win the right to post a review under, under a shared account? And then what if digital native companies could easily distribute control of their social media feed to every single employee so that everyone kind of has um, an ability to uh, contribute to, to the presence on the web? And if you give us another scroll there, Ramon. Um, yeah, we've got a sort of sense of how you can make decisions about identity, uh, but how do we sort of get a sense of the members beyond just uh, you know, a pseudo anonymous address? And those have become obviously significant organizational structures in the Web3 space, bringing in completely new ways of organizing communities, treasuries, voting on change, distributing funds. But, you know, they're focused on right now, maybe enabling the sort of uh, the financials uh, and the operations. Um, they're becoming increasingly harder to manage. Uh, and they're becoming very fragmented and siloed across lots of different platforms. Like we all know the Discord problem. Uh, so what if DAOs were built on a suite of tools that really help to integrate not just governance and finance, but also a sense of identity and a sense of community and uh, communication. And those on-chain tools for DAOs right now, they're, you know, they're typically centered around the voting and finance, like I mentioned, and they're uh, by default sort of pseudo-anonymous with no identity, no sort of social presence um, attached to any sort of voting or anything. But what, if you introduce sort of social connections between individuals and content represented on chain, then tools can expand to include that social and productivity features that otherwise, you know, would exist, you know, completely off chain in other different silos. So what if DAOs had a dashboard for members that automatically showed the collective interests, maybe the authorship and the favorite content of its members? What if DAOs had a set of tools that enabled them to have one view of their operation, their communications solving that discord problem? And what if those uh, had more elaborate voting systems based on group membership, allowing some communities to run in sort of representative manners, perhaps with boards and committees empowered to make certain decisions alone? Well, we just opened uh, opened three sort of boxes just now, but there's a lot more to explore, and I'm going to ping it over to Ramon to take us home with the wildcard section. Thank you. So that that went broad. Um, so. We talked about kind of like the idea of like an open social graph and how empowering that can be. We talked about kind of like building potential new lens tooling that kind of like helps expand the ecosystem itself. We talked about kind of like the idea, the ideas or concepts that kind of like to, to evolve to create the economy itself. And we kind of like, we know that DAO tooling is a huge emergent space that needs a lot, kind of that, that is growing and thriving right now and uh, needs this social character. So kind of with those things, one thing where we wanted to end with or go now is like looking a little bit more and like, how could this manifest itself into front end experiences or looking into that space and so we have a couple of sections here that we want to run through through a little bit to just inspire you to kind of like see how the world is already super social but it can can now like where we can hopefully now put a web free twist on it or make it more web free native and a big belief we we have a big belief that music is in inherently social. We go to concerts, we share playlists, we have a deep connection to artists 
themselves and like we want to like like uh, we want to get like be connected to them we often are more willing to pay to an individual artist a significant amount than to to kind of like to a service so kind of like how can we rethink the relationship between an artist and uh us and create novel music platforms that take this web free mentality of ownership and relationship together and kind of like build new uh, primitives uh, that are that enable new things to do there. I think it's also going there with uh, with the, the the gaming world that is social by default, right? It doesn't matter if you play alone together in with others around you in in a uh, in a game like Fortnite, Roblox, or all of this, but like those games become more alive if there if there are real people around you that you can interact with. But gaming is not just inside a game; it's like the whole world of of Twitch, Discord, all of this. This kind of like economies and worlds around games itself that like even in this even in this chat right now, we have a chat going on on the side where we have. A conversation going on and that we use the prompts to bring it into our live conversation right now here so kind of like how can we move from those very broadcasting tools to kind of like more interactive elements and conversations and like that that bring multiple worlds together in novel ways so so one way is like how can we how can play be even more social like what would it be to build the uh, iOS game center on top of lines to easily find find friends to play against with. Like we all probably had our wordle moment in the last couple of weeks where we just kind of like also love to show up how good we were on Twitter or not uh, as me. But like the idea is kind of like we love those connections. We love to compete. We love to kind of like like comp challenge our friends and like a lot of this kind of gaming is super social so but right now it's locked into specific worlds so can can we do this even make more social and what this makes me also super interested about is like i spent way too much time building up my gta 5 character in gta online and like that is a part of my identity too what if an online an in-game character has its own social graph too and how can we build those worlds around that one thing that we haven't touched yet, but like we want to go back is, yes, we talk a lot about lens tooling and like uh, DAO tools and all of this, but like e-commerce is one of the prime reasons the internet exists and thrives and grows. And like what we know from history is that wherever you establish a market, a community will build around it. No matter if it was the Silk Road, a, a marketplace in a, in a Southern European city that the whole town is, coming together to kind of like exchange gossip and news and whatever happens around it, like markets build culture, right? And like, even like looking at like the, like marketplaces like Depop or Facebook, they're in, they're extremely social too. And I think we can go to the next level, like where we can actually see what our friends are up to, what our friends are recommending, what, what, they are using right now or not using where we can maybe get early access to it. And even like Rich was talking about uh, rethinking algorithms based on our preferences. There's a lot of like ways how we can rethink shopping itself. And like, let's be honest, like Instagram turned into one of the greatest shopping malls in all time. So like shopping is social. So how can we gain the control a little bit more back and like using it uh, for us? The other thing is, I think we sometimes miss that even the way we work and all of that is social too. This talk was created in Figma and FigChan, right? That's how, how we, at least as our team are working. It's like, you're following other people around in a file and like you're building connections there too. So no matter if you use Notion, GitHub, Figma or all of those tools, even Google Slides, there's a lot of like social elements and moments that we create. And I, I think, again, it's it's about kind of like making sure that you find your friends, that you can create new assets and all of that together. That makes it extremely powerful to think about like, what does it mean when we have an open graph and we bring it together with the composability of Web3, together with the potential new business models that we can make, think through that come through DeFi and blockchains in general to kind of like create, like rethink work, social gaming and all of that together. I wanna end with 
one of my favorite things is like, I think we, it's easy to get super heavy weighted in those conversations. And one of our like favorite ideas that we just want to leak here and show here is like the, around the ideas of memes. And a little bit background here is like, for me, the when I think about TikTok or all of memes, it's like, this is web free culture. It, like someone creates an expression and others start to build on it. Like memes are composable by default. Like that's how they work, right? We're building on top of each other and it creates this ecosystem of reactions and interactions and evolutions and all of those, like they grow. And like, so one thing that we start to think about and even like, just kind of like, how can we build a social network just around memes? And I think that just show, that for us shows um, the actual power of Lens itself, right? We can, we could build the next evolution of Apple Music or Spotify. We can lean into it, building a social network, but it can be as small or nerdy as just a forkable meme creator on chain that kind of like shows you to build how your memes are spreading and evolving over time. And like that, that for me makes this super interesting. So to kind of like summarize where we ended with our thing is like we we started with that a social graph, we really just kind of like at the tip of an iceberg here, right? We talked about, it's really about uh, empowering you, uh, us, ourselves. It's about kind of like that this is bigger than Twitter and Facebook and covers other things. And it's really about expanding what Lens can be from visualizing our networks to rethinking about how we label things and organizing it for better algorithm. It's about kind of like better matching between creators, more insights from our relationships between fans and audiences and new business model, and also kind of like the whole aspect of community itself. So this was a lot of talking from our side, and we hope that we at least could bring up the iceberg a little bit and like show a little bit more potential of like how big this opportunity actually is, especially when we start to cross connect the services that we build on top of it all together. Um, I do think we have a couple of audience questions. So I think that's a perfect moment to kind of like close this uh, conversation and like hear what are some questions. So let's freaking build this together. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for uh, going through that amazing talk. And um, there were so many amazing comments and how well kind of thought out everything that you talked about is, as well as uh, just overall the, the detail and the attention you put into uh, preparing this. So it was it was super insightful. So the few questions I want to ask, and uh, we'll kind of go to as many as we can uh, until we kind of run out of time. But uh, I, I guess uh, the first kind of question that comes in is, from kind of your perspective, having been on now both sides, like what do you think is a difference between being a designer in Web two and and now in Web three? Like, are there any specific things that stand out, or or kind of how do you assess or contrast both? I I can take take this one. I think like on a crafts level, it's not that much a difference. But what is different is that you have to think more about building for a community, building with others. You have to. Uh, uh, appreciate that everything is composable. Like if you design a brand, it's about, you have to embrace memes and that others will take the brand further. So it's a lot about giving control away and like en enabling others. So I think on that one, on a product design lens, I think the reality is that we have to acknowledge we are still in a super early nerdy stage. It's very technical often. You, you have to understand some of the smart contracts fundamentals to kind of like, like especially in the more complicated like DeFi areas to kind of like really push what design can do. And the reality is, I think there's just not as many of us designers out there. So you can't find that great inspiration first. So we need to find more of us to, to really push what design can do in this field. Absolutely. And if anyone else wants to add something, feel free to go for it. If not, I'll move on to the next question. All right, cool. I'll, I'll do the next one. So uh, kind of the other piece is uh, you talked about uh, essentially kind of how do you present information and, and what will be a, a good way to think about how Lens can make that easier. But um, what would you imagine sort of like the user ends up feeling? Uh, and and uh, so I'll try to read this for him. So uh, how do you imagine the users might feel different when interacting with a Web3-based social media network? 
um, like what kind of different emotions would they do you think they might experience compared to the current social uh, kind of net norms or just networks out there? And, and do you think this is a different emotive experience too, or is it just a different way of thinking about where the data is and who controls it at the end of the day? And it's a bit of an abstract question, but uh, that, that is a great question. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I don't think it's one that we'll know the answer to until we start to build stuff, right? And we start to put things in front of people and gauge reactions. Um, but ultimately, I think it's ho hopefully we'll be evoking an interesting reaction. Uh, the, the whole sense of ownership really is, is what, what a huge piece is here. And hopefully a sense of, I guess, um, I guess a lot of trust has been degraded from some of the sort of bigger centralized sort of social media providers. And I'm, I'm curious to see, uh, and at least from, from research that I've done on other projects about how, uh, how folk are sort of perceiving those current uh, social media providers now versus sort of the newer ones, which are decentralized by default and sort of, you know, have a lot of sort of trustless stuff um, baked in as well. So I think lo lots, to, lots to see, but hopefully um, a little bit of interesting stuff against the backlash of the centralized incumbents. I think two things to add, like, I, I really think the, the, the fact that you own your content and you're in control of it and you can decide what happens with it will change quite a bit how we think about what, how we create content, what cr content will be created and how content is curated. I think we haven't touched that space enough that creators are important, curators are the next big thing. The other thing is like, I, I actually think rage quitting will be a superpower as like we're in the sense of like if your data is portable and you're in control you actually like rage quit is actually something that can be a force for good right where like where if someone builds a better user experience a better way to moderate the content as you want it to see that has better privacy section it's not like you're locked into a system, you quit and move over. And I think that hopefully creates a lot of new competition and innovation of like actually exploring what this world even can be. Yeah, big plus onto that. A lot of stuff that we heard from Lee, Stani and Balaji earlier around this idea of like a race to create the, the best front end, the most novel and most interesting. And hopefully that's just gonna drive a great user experience, which we're all excited about. Agreed. And uh, we have uh, the final audience question I wanna ask and then we can, uh get to the next talk is, um, how do you feel about the real-time distributed collaboration sort of world in Web3? Uh, do you think that's going to be interactive, like maybe like this, this call we're in, um, or do you think that's more on kind of the broadcasting side where we're like a Twitch where people just kind of consuming what somebody's doing, but it's not really interactive? Oh, I think. On a, on a, honestly, I think that the reality is, uh, COVID and Corona, the pandemic changed the way how we think about collaborating together, right? I was at IDEO before and post-its were my life and now I haven't touched a post-it for two years. And like, I do this all through, through Figma and it changed the way we work. Before that, I couldn't imagine it. And like the technology might sometimes still buggy, not there, but like, I think real-time async, we find new ways and we, we use it in appropriate ways, right? Sometimes we want to lean back and just enjoy Twitch. And sometimes I actually would love to kind of like be the annoying person on the side that can actually influence as a audience Twitch for the ones I'm watching playing. And like, I think there will be new forms of interaction that can be enabled through those things. And like, it, it's probably like, it's not A or B, it's a gradient of things that we are enabling here. Absolutely. Well, Simon, Ramon, Rich, thank you so much for that amazing uh, talk. And uh, this was just cool. great. So thank you so much. Thanks, thank you. Bye-bye. Everyone. Bye. -bye. Bye.